This is Dr. Ted Hildebrandt in his teaching on New Testament. This is session number 24, Romans part 2. Okay, um, last time we were laying out the book of Romans and we were kind of going out chapters 1, 2, and 3 showing that humankind was sinful, the Gentiles were sinful, and we showed the Jews were sinful, and then chapter 3, basically all of sin and come short of the glory of God. And then having worked through the sinfulness of humankind, God doesn't leave us there. Basically, we move on to salvation, and salvation is the study of soteriology. So last time we went through these different aspects in other words, when Jesus died for our sins, what did he really do? And what happens is it's really multifaceted. And so when Christ dies for our sins, we went through these things of justification, the being made righteous before God, redemption, being bought back, atonement, that our shame is covered, propitiation, that God is wrathful, angry at our sin and things. And so he needs to be, his wrath needs to be appeased. Propitiation or expiation, the need for washing to become clean, reconciliation, we're enemies with God, now being reconciled back with to God. And then lastly, adoption, that we are now called the children of God. We address God as our Father. It's a wonderful, uh, wonderful thing, the, the fictive kinship terminology of father, child, that God gives to us, and it's beautiful. So these are all ways, in different ways, that Jesus saves us, so to speak. So salvation is a, is a manifold concept. Today we want to move on to some things that are really pretty tricky. And by the way, it's okay to disagree with these things. Uh, Even in our own faculty, we disagree over some of these things. I'm going to kind of go through different uh, perspectives on on things, and and then I'll give you kind of what I think, and of course that's the right answer. Uh, But anyway, so we'll uh, we'll go through some of the stuff that's pretty hard today. So Paul's view on the law. I want to pick up here. And go down a little bit. Uh, Paul's view of the law. uh, The old view of this was that there was a tension in the book of Romans and with Paul between the law and grace. The law and grace. There's this tension between law and grace. The Jews were seen as hypocritical in that, that they used the law to establish their own righteousness. And Christianity is now the way. And so there's this conflict between Judaism and Christianity. This this and so Judaism is actually a foil to Christianity. Um, the law and grace thing, the law and faith thing, the, the flesh and the spirit, and the Jews being more interested in the flesh that is with circumcision, individual salvation, um, and then the focus has been kind of long term was on individual salvation. If you confess with your mouth, you believe in your heart that Jesus, you'll be saved. And so that we took that in very individually, and uh, this is the kind of the old view of Romans, the old view of Paul. And what's happened is that there's a new view that's come into play. And this new view is put out by a guy named Dunn and uh, E.P. Sanders. And basically what they're saying is, no, the, there's not this uh, tension between law and gospel, so to speak, but rather it's inclusion and exclusion, that the Jewish people, um, that these things of circumcision, the law and things, those were ethnic markers, those were ethnic markers for the Jews. And what's happening is Paul is trying to transcend those ethnic markers of circumcision, of the law, of eating kosher. He's trying to supersede those things. And in Christianity, the Christianity goes beyond Judaism and these ethnic markers. And so now Christianity can become more universal. Christianity can become more universal and inclusive. And inclusive, whereas Jew- Judaism was exclusive, you had to do their things to be included in their group. Now the group is spreading out, and so this is more talking then about this Jew Gentile and the, and the coming together as as a as a church. That that's more the point of Romans in a lot of ways than individualistic salvation. And so this is a big shift. Um, I'm not sure where I stand on this. I kind of like the old way myself that talks about sin because sin is taught in individual salvation, individual participation in sin, and then salvation individually. So I like that. But I like some of this new stuff too that I think he's making a good point that, um, that it's, it's Paul's working with Jews and Gentiles and trying to bring, bring them together in one church. And that seems to be behind some of his, what it, some of his teaching here. In... Uh, Romans chapter 7, verse 12, 
basically Paul gives his view of the law, and he says the law is holy, righteous, and good. So Paul tells us flat out, so Paul is not lambasting the law and saying the law is, is gone now. In Christ we have grace, we have no need of the law anymore, and dismissing it. Paul says, no, the law is holy, righteous, and good. And so that's a, a very interesting uh, thing that he says there. The law, Paul says, was meant man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. Righteousness that comes from God through faith in Jesus Christ. There is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In other words, there's no difference, Jew or Gentile, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that's kind of the context for that verse a little bit. So what we have here is, therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. So we're talking about sin last time and how we weasel our way around sin in our culture. Sin has actually evaporated and things. Um, People don't like to talk about sin anymore. It's not even discussed much. But we said Jesus Christ came as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. So if you do away with sin, you're doing away with the whole need for salvation. And that's, uh, that's a pretty big thing. And that's what people are trying to do today, it seems to me, in a lot of ways. The law was meant to expose expose us basically and the law through the law we become conscious of sin so through the law we become conscious of sin and that's its function so the function of the law is to expose and to quicken our conscience to make our conscience come alive so that we're aware that we are sinning but again in our culture we're we're told what i'm okay you're okay we're okay we're not really sinners or anything you're a good person i'm a good person we're all good people and that kind of thing and Paul's saying, no, the law was meant to expose us to the fact of sin and, um, and that, that we are sinners, okay? And so this is, this is a big deal. And again, it's really countercultural to what we experience today. The Jews flipped the law on its head. So the Jews took the law, and rather than exposing their sin, the Jews used the law to show how righteous they were. And so basically they subverted the function of the law was to point out sin so that they would need a savior. But instead, they took the law to show how good they were. And I've been in churches, you may have been in churches too, where the people in the churches, you do it their way and then you're the right way. And if you do it not their way, then you're the wrong way. And they basically use their little legal system to show whether you're approved or not approved and very tight in their things. I know I grew up in that kind of an environment. And what Paul's saying is, no, the law is meant to show us a consciousness of sin. It's not meant to show us our righteousness. It's meant to show us our sin and to expose sin. Abraham, he uses our father Abraham, and Dr. Wilson's book is Our Father Abraham is based on a lot of the book of Romans here. And he basically says Abraham was justified before he was circumcised. So before circumcision came on Abraham, that he was kind of like identified with this ethnic marker of of circumcision, before circumcision and before the law, because Abraham did not have the law. The law came through Moses like 500 years later. So what you have is before the law and before circumcision, it says that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. And so this is a big thing then. Faith, then Abraham believed God. It was counted to him for righteousness. Before, in one sense, he was circumcised as a Jew. And before, he had the law. Abraham was justified by faith. And that is the way then that all humanity now, we come to God kind of the way Abraham did. Okay, Abraham went by faith and he was justified by faith. Before he was circumcised and before he had the law, that's kind of how we do too. And so in Abraham, Jews and Gentiles find a common father, so to speak. He actually takes it back further than Abraham, and he goes back to universal, to Adam, and basically said that we are all dead in Adam. When Adam sinned, that the whole human race basically died in Adam. And that we are all then, if we are all dead in Adam then we are all made alive in Christ. And so there's this really interesting comparison between Adam, which brought death and to all humanity, and Christ, who now brings life to everyone. And so there's a kind of a comparison. Adam brought death, Christ brings life. And so this is, um, so he goes back to Adam, particularly in chapter 5, in the universality of sin. Law is not a means of justification then. We're not declared righteous before God by keeping the law and by keeping all these things. Rather, it's a misuse of the law to say 
that the law shows us how good we are. The law is meant to expose us to sin and the sinfulness of our lives. So that's part of what Paul's view of the law is. And I want to hit next this notion of sanctification um, that Paul develops here, particularly in Romans chapter 7 um, and what this is about. Um, Okay, and so sanctification, and let me get down to, oh boy. Yeah, sanctification. What is? We talked about justification. Justification was basically that God attributes righteous, imputes righteousness to us. Sanctification is actually our sanctify. Sanctify something means to make it holy. And so what we have here is basically... Um, how do individuals become holy um, in God's sight? Um, we are told to be perfect, even as our Father in heaven is perfect. Uh, we're told, does anybody remember that passage in Leviticus, be holy as I, the Lord your God, is holy? And so we're commanded, even in the New Testament, to be, to be holy as the Lord your God is holy. Sanctification has to do with this process of holiness. Um, are some of you from Wesleyan churches? Wesleyan churches? Wesleyan churches are, are known for, they're called part of the holiness movement. And so this is kind of a big deal. Now Paul, he struggles in chapter 7. He's worked with sin and now salvation through Jesus Christ. And in chapter 7, Paul really struggles with his own sanctification. And we'll have to look at that in terms of what it is. Um, here's what Paul says in Romans 7.15. He says this, For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. Boy, oh boy, I don't know where that sound is coming from. But uh, anyways, okay, we're stuck. Okay, Paul makes this comment and as he's struggling with his own life. He says, for what I, what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. In other words, Paul says, I want to do good, but he says, when I want to do good, I end up doing what I don't want to do. So I find this law at work, Paul says, so when I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in my members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind, making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work in my members. What a wretched person I am. Who will rescue me from the body of this death? And so the question comes up here about Paul's sanctification. Is it possible for a Christian to become perfect? And we would say no, because we're kind of comfortable with the fact that we were sinners and we just don't care that much anymore. But the scripture says, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. What does that mean? Be holy as I, the Lord your God, is holy. And so, I am holy. And so Paul then struggles with this, and he says, the things I don't want to do, I, I do are the very things that I do. So there are basically four approaches to this passage in Romans 7. Okay, And this is different. Different churches will take different approaches on this. And what does sanctification mean? How do I become like Christ? Okay, Sanctification basically is how do I become holy? How do I become like Jesus would? Some people say that Romans 7 is Paul talking about before he was a Christian. So Paul says, before I was a Christian, I struggled with these things. And so the things I didn't want to do, I ended up doing and stuff because Paul was not a Christian at that time. Okay? And so this kind of avoids the whole problem and says it's pre, before he knew Christ. He's describing what his soul was like without the power of the Holy Spirit and without the power of redemption in his life and reconciliation with God, all those things. This was, this was his struggle before he was a Christian. Um, some people hold that. Another people would hold this second view that this is a young believer's struggle that this is a young believer struggle, that when a person's new in Christ, they struggle because they come in with all this baggage of sin in their life and they struggle with it then until they come to know Christ. And so there's this growth uh, development in things and they, they struggle and they grow in maturity. And as they grow in maturity, then the struggle for, with sin dies down. Um, some people suggest that this is Paul describing his struggle in his flesh. Not in the spirit, not in the spirit, but in his flesh. And so this is Paul talking as a fleshly person, saying his struggles in the flesh and not in the spirit and things. And so that, again, kind of uh, these three positions people have held at various times. I, uh, I take a real simple thing on this. I think 
and I think many of you that are in this room would probably think the same way, that I think this is Paul's struggle as a mature Christian, that Paul is a mature Christian. Um, is, is an immature Christian sometimes not even aware of their own sin? Is somebody who's young in the Lord not even aware sometimes of their own sin? But as a person becomes more mature in the Lord, they become more and more aware of their own sinfulness. And so I, what I'm suggesting is, and to quote a guy named Watchman Lee, this is the normal Christian life. That what Paul is saying is this struggle, the stuff that I don't want to do, I end up doing, and the things that I want to do, I don't do. Uh, that Paul is describing the normal Christian life then, that the struggle in sanctification that we have. Yes, God has imputed righteousness to us, but there's still, in living life, there's a struggle. The knowing, the knowing of God in the now, the knowing of God in the now, as you go from class to class, you know, how do you experience the presence of God as you go from class to class? That's a struggle. And you say, well, I need to walk with God. I need to walk with Christ at every moment. But then you go into a physics class and you say, holy cow, you know, how does this relate? And all of a sudden you're off in that stuff and things. Well, it does relate. And can you experience the presence of God while you're doing physics? Can you experience somebody's working, say, in the lane doing dishes? Can you do dishes for the glory of God? Again, I come back to that book by Brother Lawrence called Practicing the Presence of God. He was basically a monk and he washed dishes, but he washed dishes and he decided he's going to wash dishes for the glory of God. And that's uh, practicing the presence of God kind of thing. So what I'm suggesting here is that Romans 7, Paul's struggle, is Paul's struggle as a mature Christian. And he's just telling us that when a person becomes a Christian, actually the, the struggle intensifies because before that we were dead in our trespasses and sin. So we didn't struggle against sin because we were, hey, we're dead in our trespasses and sin. Sin was okay. But when we become alive, we're regenerated, we become alive to Christ, now all of a sudden we have all these struggles that we didn't used to have. That's why sometimes it gets me, you know, you hear people, you know, preaching and stuff and saying, you know, you follow Christ and, you know, Christ will give you all these wonderful things and you won't have any more struggles in your life. And what I'm suggesting to you is the Bible just says, no, no, there will be that actually some of the struggles will actually intensify. And the more, the closer you get to Christ, the more intense the struggles will get. By the way, did Jesus Christ himself struggle? You know, Father, take this cup from me and that kind of thing. And so what I'm saying is struggle is part of the Christian life. Struggle is, is part of the Christian life, and I think Paul manifests that then in Romans 7. And I think there'll be times in your life you struggle with different things. And each stage, as you move through different stages of life, uh, the struggles change. Some senses, though, well, the struggles that you have now, I've always thought of the things that I've struggled with, that it, I, I thought when I was a younger person I got a hold of it, and then all of a sudden I realized here I am 10 years later struggling with the th- same thing that I struggled with 10 years earlier, but it, it's wearing a different mask. So it's kind of like it's different, it's different, it's different. And then all of a sudden I pull off the mask and I see, no, it's really the same thing I was working with 10 years earlier. And so what happens is as you go through life, you'll see these things pop up and they pop up in different stages of life in different ways with different masks. It looks like it's different, but it's really the same core thing. And so what I suggest is that as early as you can, get on to those core issues. What are the real core things in your being that move you and that, that, that lead you away from Christ? Those things, will, they'll take different masks as you move through life. So Paul's struggle, this is the doctrine of sanctification then and how you become holy before God and you, you wrestle with that. You wrestle with that sometimes successfully, sometimes. Um, 2 Corinthians 10.5, beautiful passage. It says that we take every thought captive to Christ we take every thought captive to Christ. And this means then that our thoughts and in intents of our heart, that we monitor those things and we commit our thoughts and in intents of our heart to Christ. And so those are, take every thought captive. And a lot of the battle takes place in the thought life and what, what, what types of things you're thinking about and that and I'm thinking about now. All right, we had to get this finally at last. Um, we're going to end up talking about predestination and election and some things that are very uh, debate. Now, this is where the debate kicks in, okay, predestination, and we'll give you uh, the answer to that, the election. Now, I think, I believe in election. I believe in election. I think, um, actually, everybody, is anybody from New York? Is anybody from New York here? Yeah, do you believe in election? I think they're having the election today, as a matter of fact. Did you vote? (laughs) Okay, and so I'm being facetious here. When you talk about election, we think of uh, the elections going on in New York City between, you know, Bernie and, 
Hillary and between Donald and the rest of the world and stuff. And so, anyway, so, sorry. I, I say that just, you, you, believe me, you don't know what I think on these political issues. Uh, our family, we do, um, how should I say, other families do like uh, football, you know, the Patriots and, you know, Brady and did he really deflate the thing? Anyways, okay. And then other people do, you know, basketball. We did the bills at one time in our life and stuff. And they do baseball, of course. You got to do the, the socks around here and stuff. My family, our family does politics like most family does football, okay? In other words, my, our family's quite into it and stuff. We have big arguments and stuff like that. But I, I realized after last semester, it was really funny. Anyways, I made some comments and students totally. Um, Anyways, they didn't catch what I was, my drift, and so they thought I was going off like this, and I was really going off like that. So I decided I better not do many more jokes like that anymore. So anyways, okay, election. What is election? Okay, election is where God chooses, God chooses uh, those he will redeem. Okay, God chooses, and, and it has to, election has to do with the choice of God. And so you get in Romans 8.28, it says, For we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called, notice they have been called. They don't come to Christ and believe in Christ. Now it says basically, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew. So God apparently foreknew them beforehand. For those God foreknew, he also predestined. He predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. So God kind of foreknew them ahead of time. He then predestines them, and then he calls them. He personally calls them, and he he also called them. And those he called, he also justified. So there's a succession here from he foreknew them, he predestined them, he called them, and then he justifies them. And those he justified, he glorified. Okay, And so you get this notion that a person is righteous before God, and then he participates kind of in the glory of God themselves. And so this is Romans 8.28, largely cited in this notion of election and things. I should read some other passages here uh, from Ephesians 1.4. These are passages that are used uh, for the doctrine of election or predestination. In Ephesians 1.4, it says, For he chose us in him, he chose us in him, before the creation of the world. He chose us in him before the creation of the world. So that's predestination. Before the world was even, he's already chosen us before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his children through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. So in Christ, we are received adoption, but that adoption was foreknown before the world was created. And so this, again, shows this kind of predestination, election, before the world was created, God chose us in him kind of thing. Romans 9, um, 11. Yet before the twins, who are the twins? Jacob and Esau. Okay, Jacob and Esau. Yet, Romans 9, 11, yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad in order that God's purposes in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls. She was told, the older will serve the younger. The older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Before they were even born, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Before they were even born, before they did anything, they were predestined, they were elected, chosen to do these types of things. Okay? Um, there's other passages. Uh, let me just use the Jeremiah 1.5. Jeremiah 1.5, Jeremiah is told this, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Okay? And be, um, before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah, before you were even born, I knew you. I set you apart as a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah, before you were even born. And Jeremiah says, well, man, God, you know, what kind of choice did I have? You know, didn't have much choice there. And, uh, but God says, no, I, before you were even born, I, I predestined you and things. So. so election has to do with God's choices and stuff. Now, um, this, this, the, the, one of the Puritans' terror then is, am I chosen of God? 
Did God choose me? Did God predestine me? Did God know? What happens if God didn't choose me? I mean, it's like I, I thought I could choose him, but now he chooses me before I was even born. I don't stand a chance. What if Jacob, if I loved Esau, if I hated? What if it's Hildebrand I hated? And they say, well, but I didn't do anything. And he said, well, I, did, I hated you before you were even born. Okay? You say, well, man, I don't stand a chance then. And so the Puritan kind of terror, the kind of terror, am I chosen? Am I part of the elect? Am I part of the elect, those that are chosen? And this kind of terror comes on and things. And at times in my life, I think I've felt that stuff. How does human choice then, how does human choice fit with divine election? That God chose us before we were born. How does that fit with human choice? By the way, some of you guys have been in my Old Testament class. Does Hildebrandt really push the thing of human choice? Yes, right from the Garden of Eden. Human choice is a really big thing. So then how do you mesh that with this divine election stuff? And there's, it seems to be like, you know, God did all this stuff before the world began, and then yet we're, you know, Adam makes choices, Eve makes choices, Cain makes choices. So how do you put those two together and things? And so what I want to do next is work through different um, ways that people have done to explain how these two things go together. And it is rather, I, I should say, it is rather complex. And, um, and so... Um, and how should I say this, too? Okay, that's what that noise is. It's the projector. Uh, the, we should shut that off, probably, uh, with this stuff. We should shut this whole lecture down with this. Okay, so I'm going to go through and explain uh, these positions. Now, by the way, some of you may be from some of these traditions. Actually, to be the, tr- the truth be known, I'm from several of these traditions, okay? In other words, I grew up in one church. I was ordained in a Presbyterian church, and then I now, who knows, where I'm at Gordon College now, and anyways, and so it's just different. So so what I'm saying is, you're going to meet people where there's going to be big disagreements on this stuff. People throw people out of churches for this stuff, and by the way, so I want to make sure you come away with the right answer. So, okay, that was a joke, okay, and so um, I to be honest with you, I'll give you what I think about this stuff, but I'll also, I'm, I'm more interested, I think, I'm more interested, I think, that you catch my attitude than that you catch my cognitive content. Because you're going to have to work through the cognitive content of how you put divine election and selection and predestination with human choice. You're going to have to work through how you put that together. But I, anyway, so how do you work with these things? Well, the first type of thing I want to call hyper-Calvinistic, okay? Help hyper-Calvinistic. Now, by the way, this is not what John Calvin held, I think, but this is a, a very, what I would call, hard determinism, that God does everything. In other words, this, this view pushes really, I want to call it ultra-reformed. Ultra-reformed. There are people who are this ultra-reformed kind of thing, position. They push the good part. What I like about the reformed tradition, what I love about the reformed tradition is they push the sovereignty of God, Okay. Now, what is the sovereignty of God? The sovereignty of God means God is king, that God rules the universe, okay? That God is king. The sovereignty of God is that God is king and that he rules the universe. Is it God versus Satan? No, no, no. Is it God versus Satan? No, no, it's not that way. God is over all. God is over all. It's not God versus Satan. There is one God and he is over everything. And so the sovereignty, the kingship of God that he rules and, and that kind of thing, that's, that's one of the good points here. Um, the divine, because of this ultra view, they, they basically see God as, as choosing, predestining, doing all this work. God does everything, and the human beings don't do much of anything. So it's, things are pretty determined. And so I want to call this kind of determinism determinism kind of thing where God does everything and we're just kind of like almost like robots going through I am sinful now I choose because God makes me choose and things like that and it's very um, predetermined and that kind of stuff Um, the problem I see with this this position of the ultra position is that there are a lot of whosoever will there are a lot of whosoever will you know for God so loved the world that what for God so loved the world that Whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Whosoever will. Okay? So it's, it's, a lot of it has to do with human choice. I tried to show you guys in the Old Testament, human choice after human choice after human choice. They weren't, 
God actually dealt with human beings in a very interactive, organically connected way. Moses prays to God and God changes his mind, says, I'm going to wipe them out. I'm going to wipe them out. Moses says, oh God, please don't wipe them out, man. If you wipe them out, that's going to be bad for both you and I. Don't wipe them out and stuff. And he says, I don't want... Anyways, and so Moses goes off in Numbers 13 and 14. And God says then, 10 verses later, God says, okay, Moses, I won't wipe them out as you asked. And so God actually... Oh, a human being had impact on God. He says, I won't wipe them out as you asked, Moses. And so what I'm wanting to suggest is then this, this ultra position, I think, doesn't account for some parts of Scripture. Now, there's, I want to call these lucky Calvinists. Is anybody from Reformed tradition? Actually, I am. So, and I do this with a smile on my face. The, the Calvinists, they don't like the term lucky. And so I just want to use it just to be annoying. I shouldn't do this, and I shouldn't do this on tape, too. This is terrible. But anyway, um, I call them lucky Calvinists, which would be really offensive to them. And so I want to, let me just say contingency. I'll call it contingency Calvinism. And what this, these people are more reasonable, and they work with categories. I'm thinking of a guy now, uh, um, oh, Knowing God. Who, who wrote Knowing God? Man, my brain just went. Um, there's a book out called Knowing God. Um, Anyways, Knowing God is a superb book written by a guy who teaches at Vancouver, at uh, Regent College, and my, the brain just is, is lost who he is, okay? But anyways, and what he does is he introduces these kind of terms. Terms like, do you know what, um, and let's look at some of these terms, an oxymoron is. What's an oxymoron, okay? Um, if I said a wise fool, a wise fool, that's oxymoronic, okay? Oxy, what's moron mean? Moron mean, okay, we're not allowed to say it anymore. Okay, it's politically incorrect, but moron means, okay, moron. Oxy, oxy means like wise. So oxymoron means wise fool, wise fool. By the way, that doesn't, those terms clash, okay? Oxymoron. So something is oxymoronic, it's like hot cold or something like that, stuff that doesn't work, you know what I'm saying? It doesn't, that's called an oxymoron. They work, these, these contingency Calvinists, these are, maybe I get a better word for them. Maybe let's call them softer Calvinists. The ones are really hard deterministic. There's, they're the minority. But most of them work with this, what I call soft Calvinism kind of thing. Or we could say the one is reformed with a big R, and that these, these soft ones are reformed with a little r. And I think that's maybe the way some of them describe themselves, too, with a big R reformed or a little r. The little r reformed people, they talk about this second category, which is this category of antinomy. Okay, do you see the second term here? It says antinomy. Antinomy means you've got two things that are contradictory. You've got two things that seem to be contradictory, and you can't, you don't know how they fit together. So you believe them both. You believe them both, but you can't fit them together. And so this is called an antinomy. There are two things that look like they're contradictory, but they somehow must work together. But we don't understand how they fit together. Okay. And so this is. Um, oh, gee, man, I can't. I can't as soon as class is over, I'll remember the guy's name. But anyways, and, pardon? Oh, J.I. Packer. J.I. Packer. Thank you. Okay, J.I. Packer, okay, this antinomy, the two things, God's sovereignty in terms of he elects and predestines people, and people still choose. How do you fit those together? He says, basically, we've got to believe both of those things. We've got to believe both of them, but how they fit together, we don't have a clue how to fit them together. And so, therefore, this is called, he calls it an antinomy, and basically, what I like about this view is that it leaves you with mystery and wonder. You realize you've got two things here in Scripture that, that you that you wonder about, and they cause mystery and wonder. And I think, so I like this antinomy approach, um, has some really good things about it and things. Now, what's, what's a paradox? Is a paradox different than an antinomy? Antinomy is two things that look opposite, that we don't know how they fit together. A paradox goes something like this. Let me just read you this story. It's kind of an interesting thing for a paradox here. It says, for example, this is a paradox. Consider a situation in which a father and a son are driving down a road. The car crashes into a tree and the father is killed. The car crashes into a tree, the father is killed. The boy is rushed to the nearest hospital where he's preparing for an emergency surgery. On entering surgery, 
The surgeon says, I can't operate on this boy. He's my son. That's a paradox. Now, what's a paradox? A paradox is, what does it make you think about, you say, wait a minute, a paradox is something that looks like it's totally contradictory, but does it call you into it to try to understand it? There's something that's missing here that we're not told that we need to figure out. And so it's like a puzzle. Paradox is like a puzzle. It calls you in and say, hmm, I wonder what's, it, you know, but you, you, you just told me that the father was killed in the accident. How can, if he's killed in the accident, how does a dead person operate on his son? And then your brain starts thinking, hmm, how can this person say then, if they take him to the hospital, I can't operate on this, he's my son. It was his mother. Okay? Did that, a lot of you guys come to that, that it was his mother? I'm seeing some heads shaking. You're smarter than I am, okay? I was, you know what I was, th- I, actually, okay, so, so there was the mother in there, so the father was killed. The mother says, it's my son, okay? And that's how the, the two was it. I was thinking, because I was stuck on the father thing, and see, that's what a paradox does, I was thinking it was a stepfather. Did anybody think stepfather? Oh, gee, thank you. I, I just, I was so worried. I, was, I, I missed the mother thing totally, and then I felt like a, a dingbat. But anyways, that's called a paradox, okay? Something that calls you in that you try to wrestle with and struggle. What I like about J. what J.I. Packer does in this book, Sovereignty, um, Sovereignty and the Will of God, is basically that uh, he sees it as an antinomy. Two things that are opposed that we don't know how they fit together. And so we're, it draws us to mystery and wonder and to think about God. So that's the, the contingency or lucky Calvinist. Don't you ever use that term, lucky Calvinist. They'll be really upset with you. Just no, actually, I should probably take it out of here. Um, now, I want to run you through basic the basics of Calvinism, and I'll give you, I'm kind of a reformed used to be. In other words, I used to be reformed, but I kind of have migrated off that. Um, and so I say that, and then people say, well, then they know not to trust me, and that's probably right. That's probably right. You need to trust the Bible, not what I'm saying. But here's, here's basically what they call tulip, okay? And this is, when you get into Calvinism, this is, these are the five points of Calvinism. This is a big thing. So tulip, a Calvinistic thing, they'll say, first of all, Calvinism, total depravity. Total depravity, um, and uh, people are sinful. We are sinful to the core of our being. We are sinful totally depraved, okay? Romans 1, 2, and 3, where we engage the vices of life and we miss the virtues. And so basically, uh, we're totally depraved. Um, now, you, I'm going to critique each one of these just because I'm ornery, but how should I say, I do believe people are depraved. But when I look at totally depraved, what I noticed growing up was when people that held total depravity, they were looking at everybody else saying, oh, these students are, these millennial students are totally depraved and stuff. They're always looking outward and stuff. And what I'm saying is I think a much wiser thing is to look inward with the total depravity thing. So when I look outward, I try to look at you guys as actually made in the image of God. Made in the image of God. And by the way, is that totally negative or is that really positive? That's really positive. And so what happens is that I choose to look at other people as made in the image of God. When I look at myself, I have to process and I say, well, man, some thoughts. I, I need to do this. I need to think about this. And my thoughts aren't right and things I need to work on and things. And so anyways, total depravity. I like depravity, but I don't like the word total depravity. Because, by the way, can even, can even a secular person who doesn't know Christ, can there be some good there? I told you I worked in a maximum security prison. Maximum security prison. The guy in Indiana that holds the state record for the number of life sentences against him. He's been on America's 10 Most Wanted. Um, someday I'll tell the story. I better be careful with the tape, though. But anyways, I'll tell the story. He actually escaped from the maximum security prison. Um, but anyway, uh, he, um, I better not even give his name because it's on tape, but I'll just call him Charlie. Charlie's a good friend of mine. Okay, he has 11 life sentences against him. In the prison, they call him Mr. Charlie. Now, when they call you Mr. in the prison, that's maximum security prison, does that mean something? They don't call anybody Mr. They call him Mr. That means, this, is he a bad dude? <laughs> okay, and everybody knows this guy. Anyways, he's got quite a reputation and stuff. He's a, he's a personal friend of mine and stuff. Now, even with Charlie, is there goodness in him? Is there goodness in him? You say, he did all that stuff to all those people and he's lucky he didn't get killed and stuff. Is there goodness in him? Let me just do this. And I, I, 
using a name, and I better not say any of the rest of this stuff. You know when he escaped from prison? You know what he did? He went, now you say, well, this guy's multi-murderer, this guy's terrible individual and stuff. What he did when he got out of prison, he went to New York City, and he was working with the poor and the homeless in New York City trying to help them. He was so stinking successful at helping the homeless and poor people in New York City that he was standing, that the mayor, that the mayor of the town didn't know who he was, was honoring him, having him on the platform. And old Charlie was on the platform, and the news media came, showed a picture, and the guys in the prison said, look at there, there's Charlie, and stuff. And they went and picked him up, and stuff. But he was doing, he was helping homeless people, and Mayor... Anyways, anyways, the mayor of the city of New York City had him on the platform, didn't know who he was, and they, they caught him as a result of that. By the way, was he doing that out of the goodness of his heart, helping people? Was he, no, I'm serious. Was he doing that out of the goodness of his heart? Was he a totally evil person? What I want to say is he did some really bad stuff. I mean, really, really, really bad stuff. But did he also do some really good stuff? And so what I'm saying is, be careful of the word total depravity, okay? So you say, Hillary just doesn't like the word total, okay? You know what I'm saying is, yes, we're depraved, but don't do the total thing, okay? Is it, you see what I'm, okay. Now, the second is called unconditional election. This is going down our tulip. This means that God chooses us. There is nothing good in us that God says, well, I want some people that are, that are this good, and therefore I choose him because I know that he's going to be such a good person. Jacob, I choose Jacob because Jacob was such a man of character. Jacob, do you remember Jacob? Do you remember Esau? Which one had more character as far as truthfulness, integrity, and stuff? Esau. And God yet chooses Jacob. Jacob's going to be a cheat and a liar. He's going to lie to his own father etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So anyways, unconditional election means that there's no conditions. God chooses, God chooses whom he will choose. God chooses whom he will choose. There is no condition on that. There's no, how should I say, that he looks in a person and sees their goodness in them. No, no, it's unconditional election. Predestination is based on divine choice, nothing else. It's God's choice. He chose him. Why did he choose him? We don't know. God just chose him. Did he choose him because he was so good? No, no. God chose him because he chose him. So this is called unconditional election. Um, I have, I don't know how the mind of God works, so I don't, I don't like the word unconditional. I want to say God elects people, chooses people. Does God probably have his reasons? God probably has his reasons. So I don't want to call it unconditional. There may be conditions by which God makes choices like that. I don't know that. So I want to, again, I, I just don't, I, I like the word election, but I just don't like the word unconditional, okay? Because there may be conditions there that we just don't know about. Now, one more, actually, two, let me just hit these next ones quickly. Limited atonement, limited atonement, okay? And this is basically that God, um, that the atonement is given for those, for the elect, okay? That the atonement is given for the elect and In other words, for whom did Christ die? For whom did Christ die? Christ died for the elect. For those who would be saved, Christ died for the elect. So there's limited atonement. It applies only, atonement applies only to those for whom Christ died. My problem with this, this, again, I like the notion of atonement, okay? That Christ died for our sins, to take away our sins, to cover our shame. That's beautiful. The atonement, substitutionary atonement. Isaiah 53 is beautiful. You know, he was, he, on him, our iniquities were laid on him as a lamb before the slaughter. And, and Christ takes our iniquities away, our sin away. Those are beautiful. So I love the concept of substitutionary atonement and the various theories of atonement. But, but to say limited atonement, I just don't like that word limited. Because here's what it says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. For whom did Christ die? It says here, he, Jesus, is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. For the sins of the whole world. And so, in other words, the Bible does not portray atonement as limited, but rather Christ dies for the sins of the whole world. And that, I think, so therefore, I kind of, I, I just wish, I love the atonement idea, but I just wish they'd get rid of the limited. And then irresistible grace, that God's grace comes on a person, and it's irresistible. It's irresistible grace. Now, by the way, am I into the grace of God? Big time. For 20 years of my life, I worked at a school called Grace. When I left that school, Grace, in, in Lake, Indiana, when I left that school, 
it broke my heart because I, I was leaving grace. I was leaving grace. And that meant something to me because the grace of God, is all, that's where it's at. The grace of God is where we all are. And so, anyways, but when they say irresistible grace, what's my objection? My objection is to the word irresistible. Why don't they just say the grace of God and why don't they got to put this irresistible on that? Now, God can be irresistible, and I, uh, Jeremiah, you're going to see him say, God, you know, you're doing all this stuff to me, God, and I, I just don't like it and stuff, and, but, I, you know, you're doing it. I, how, who am I to fight God? I can't do this. And so he basically irresistible grace. But I, I want to say grace, irresistible. Do we have the ability to make choices? And when, it, when, it's, when you say irresistible grace, it, like, takes away from the human choice. And so what I'm suggesting is then I love the concept of grace. I'm in, totally in love with it. Um, actually, if you want to hear somebody do grace, one of the best people to do grace, on the website, I taped a guy named, uh, actually, he's a brother of mine, by a different mother, though. Um, but his name is Dr. Dan Darko. And Darko, in the prison epistles, explains the grace of God as well as I've heard anybody in my life. It was just, I mean, I was literally, I was taping this guy, and I was basically, I was almost in tears because he was describing the beauty of the grace of God in Ephesians and other places. And so if you ever want to, the Darko's lecture on the prison epistles, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, um, wonderful lectures on the grace of God. So grace of God is really where it's at. But um, irresistible, just let the irresistible go. And then finally, the perseverance of the saints. Now this one, I like the whole thing. The perseverance of the saints, this is good. Um, This has to do with eternal security. Eternal security. In other words, if you're once saved, are you always saved? And this is, is it possible to fall away? Is it possible to fall away? The perseverance of the saints. I like the phrase perseverance of the saints. In other words, if you're a Christian, you will persevere. I like that better than eternal security. Eternal security kind of sounds like social security. Is social security really solid? (laughs) You guys will never, you ever see that thing? When you start making paychecks and they take that out of your, a big chunk out of your stuff, to say, old Hildebrandt was laughing because he knew you'd never see a penny of it. I'm, I'm sorry, that's really sick on my part. But what I'm saying is, uh, so security, we, we talk about that. And so when you talk about eternal security, that kind of makes me sit down and I'm eternally secure and stuff. I like better the perseverance of the saints, that the saints will persevere. And that's more descriptive, I think, with Psalm. But by the way, are there people in the Bible that actually fell away? Are there people in the Bible that fell away? Did Judas? Did Jesus send Judas out to do miracles in his name? Matthew chapter 10. He sends the 12 out. Judas is doing miracles in Jesus' name. Okay? That's Judas. Judas turns on Christ and goes away. Okay? What about Solomon? Do you guys remember Solomon, the wisest guy that ever lived? God came to him and said, Solomon, whatever you want, ask for it. Solomon says, I want a wisdom. And, and I, want a, I want a listening a heart that can discern right and wrong. God gave him what he wanted and stuff. Solomon at the end of his life is worshiping what? Pagan idols. He's creating temples for his wives and worshiping idols. Solomon at the end of his life. And so you get these kind of things. The Israelites, did the Israelites fall away? Did the Israelites, they came out of Egypt and they go with God in the desert. God rains down manna from heaven. And what do they do? They say, hey, we want to go back to Egypt. And so the Israelites fall away. So what I'm, I'm just raising the notion, is it possible for a person to know God and fall away? Does anybody remember Balaam? Numbers 22 to 24. Balaam knows God, and yet Balaam ends up doing some really bad stuff and going away from God. So what I'm saying is, but, but let me just put it more personally. Do you know people in your family and I'm talking to myself now. Do I know people in my family that, that claimed that they knew God at a certain point in their life and then turned away? And then turned away? The answer is yeah. Yeah. I'm still working with some of that myself, and it's really, really hard when it's your kids. So anyways, perseverance of the saints, that the saints will persevere. And by the way, that doesn't mean a straight line, too. When, how do you persevere in your Christianity? Sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down. You, get, you know what I'm saying? You've seen Christians crash, and you've seen Christians. So anyways, but this is called, it's called TULIP, and this is basically, these are the five points of Calvinism. And basically, do you see what I did with almost every one of them? I took the total, I took the, the unconditional, the limited, and the irresistible, and kind of pulled those off. I love the concepts that they have there. Perseverance of the saints, I like the way that's stated, that there's a perseverance there, um, because... 
is it possible to fall away? That's, that's a big question and uh, something you want to do. So anyways, this is uh, anyways, it's called the five points of Calvinism. And we're five points past the hour, so let's take a break. <laughs> While I'm working with these concepts, um, a lot of times there are these theological concepts like TULIP that have some wonderful truths in it and stuff like that. And I'm trying to modify it and things like that. Um, I... I don't get off into theological constructs a lot because theological constructs, it seems like they build things off of the scriptures in logical forms and in history, and they build this construct. I try to stay mostly closer to scripture, and what scripture says is what I believe. And and therefore, when you start building these logical constructs, I, I guess my problem is I don't trust logic, okay? I used to teach logic. I just don't trust it. And so what I'm saying is I try to fly low to the text rather than building hierarchies of this is related to this because of, and you can deduce this and you can deduce that and you build this you build this construct on top of scripture. I kind of try to fly real close to scripture because I don't trust myself, again, totally depraved. I don't trust my own brain to, to build these kind of constructs. And so therefore I stay with the stories. And you'll notice in a lot of my classes we do a lot with the stories because the stories keep us kind of with our feet on the ground and things like that. So anyways, uh, unconditional election and things like that. There's a view, the opposite of Reformed would be this Arminian perspective. And if you guys, as I say, Reformed would be more Presbyterian churches kind of thing. Uh, Reformed coming out of Calvin and that kind of, that Puritanism and that kind of thing. Um, The Arminian perspective, basically they work a lot with foreknowledge of God. That God, in other words, the Arminian is kind of the opposite. Whereas the Reformed stresses the sovereignty of God, which is a really good thing, that God does all this stuff. The Arminians basically stress human beings' choice, human beings' choice. And then basically they look at foreknowledge, um, that God foreknew what you would choose. In other words, before the foundation of the world, God looked down history and he knew what you would choose. And so then, therefore, God chose you on the basis of his foreknowledge of what you would choose. And so the Arminian perspective emphasizes the more human side of things, the more human side, and that prevenient grace is open to all. Grace is open to all. And, um, and so this is, they, they stress more human choice and that type of thing. Now, what happened to me a, it was a couple of years ago, uh, there was this movement called the Openness of God that was really condemned very strongly at the uh, ETS meetings and other things like that. And I just want to say, um, I think it was an overreaction uh, the Reformed people really got upset with these people and, um, and went after them, particularly John Sanders and some other people. And, and I want to kind of say I think there was an overreaction there to some of this stuff. Um, what the openness people say is that the future is open, that the future is open, and that we partner with God in shaping the future, that we make choices, that, that we partner with God as we move into the future. And so um, God chooses special tasks. God chooses special tasks for certain individuals. That is, Paul was called to be an apostle. Isaiah was called to be a prophet. Jeremiah was called before he was even born, God told him. But do you remember in the Old Testament, I tried to suggest to you that the, there's mutual futures, that there could be multiple futures and that God chooses to know these multiple futures in, in various ways. Sometimes God gives us his word that Jesus Christ will be born in Bethlehem of Judea. And once God gives us a promise that Jesus Christ, Micah 5, 2, will be born in Bethlehem of Judea, Jesus will be born in Bethlehem of, of Judea because God gave us his word. But there are many other things. It would be like me saying, okay, I'm going to go home to Niagara Falls, New York. I'm going to go home to Niagara Falls, New York. Are there several ways I can get there? So I know the end destiny is Niagara Falls, but there's several ways that I could go. And so what I'm saying, suggesting is that God may fix certain things in the future, but other things are left open and that human beings participate and God participates as well. And so there may be multiple. And what I'm suggesting is then that God knows not just a singular future. I guess that's maybe the way that God doesn't know A, B, C, D, E, F, G, a singular future, but that he chooses to know the future as possibility. And we showed some places in the Old Testament, like 1 Samuel uh, 15, 1 Samuel when uh, David runs to the city of Kila, where God knows something that never happened. God knew something that never happened, uh, the city of Kila. 
And so therefore God knows something that is possible but never really happened. Do you remember what he said to Saul, King Saul, 1 Samuel 13, 13? He tells Saul, he says, Saul, if you would have obeyed me, Saul, I would have made your descendants over Israel forever. You would have been king. Your descendants, Saul, would have been king over if you had obeyed me. So that even with God, there's this if then. And Saul decided to go against God. And therefore God says, Saul, you're done. I'm going to go after a, a person of my own heart, David. So, okay, so this open then. Um, now, the openness movement itself, John Sanders said that God can't know the future because the future is not there to know. In other words, God can't know the future because of... Now, by the way, does that run into some problems with Scripture? Does God know the future? Yes, he does. And so there's where I have some major problems with the openness people. But what I think is going on is this multiple future thing, and then it opens up things for possibility. Um, the election and rejection of Israel... Um, and this is another aspect of this. Um, so the way I see it now, and I'm not saying this is right, okay? I need to come back to, it's my favorite verse on this. In other words, what I think is that God chooses to know the future as possibility. That there are literally billions of possibility, and God knows all the possibilities of the future. Some of those things he has specified in the future. Jesus will return. When Jesus returns, he will return to the Mount of Olives. As he went up from the Mount of Olives, he'll come back to the Mount of Olives. That's where he's coming back, okay? Jesus will come back, okay? God's given us his word on that. But how that happens, there's millions of ways that that can happen. And God chooses to know the future as possibility rather than... And by the way, can God choose how he knows something? Can God choose how he knows something? And what I'm saying is that he has chosen to know the future as possibility, and therefore we can make choices that impact how the future is shaped. Okay? So, now, once I've said that, let me just say this. I don't have a clue what I'm talking about. Okay? And the truth is, Isaiah chapter 40 says... God says this. God says, no one understands my understanding. No one understands my understanding. And I think that's my biggest problem with a lot of the people that I see that are Reformed. When you talk to Reformed people, it's like they think they know. They think they know. God is like this. God elects people. God justifies people. And they think they've got it all down. And what I'm telling you is, no. God says, no one understands my understanding. And so at a certain point, you've got to back off. You've got to back off and say, you know, some, so John Piper understands things this way. I understand things this way. Um, you know, Dr. Green, who I really respect, he understands things a different way. I've got to give Dr. Green space. I've got to give John Piper space, even though I don't agree with him. And I would hope that he would give me space. And that's been part of the problem is, is that people get so dogmatic about these things that they end up uh, really going after their brothers and sisters in Christ. And by the way, what is the greatest principle I do know? I do know this, that Jesus told us to love one another. And if somebody's going after another person like that in a really dictatorial and dogmatic way and stuff and destroying another person in Christ, i got to really question that and stuff. And so I want to say love is, by the way, is love, is love a multifaceted thing? Is it hard to love another person? Is it hard to love another I'm talking about your roommate. Okay. Is it hard to love another person? And the answer is, yeah. When you actually start living with a person day in and day out, you see all their flaws and things like that. And so there's, you know, it's really hard to love another person. And, and it, what I'm saying is you just... So, anyway, going back to this thing here then. Um, there is a movement in the book of... of yes. Uh, the sign-in sheets. That's a good question. No, um, actually... Ben, let me have you pass these around while you're... This guy is so talented, he not only does the videos, but he does everything. Actually, I probably should let him teach the class. <laughs> Very talented guy. Anyway, thanks, Ben. Okay. In the first part of the book of Romans, there's this thing of the Gentiles are sinful, the Jews are sinful, all are sinful, and then basically it moves to the grace of God kind of thing, and then what you have in chapters 9 through 11, basically 8 through 11, it's building this 
I think this thing where God's showing God's involvement in the process and basically showing the wonders of the grace of God. Moving to Romans chapter 11, verse 33, and I think this is the pinnacle of where it's moving. It's not moving to a big dialogue over trying to understand all the intricacies of the, of the epistemology of how God's head works and stuff. Here's where it goes for Paul. The end of Romans 11, it says, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable, how unsearchable are his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? When he says, who has known the mind of the Lord, what's the answer to that question? Who has known the mind of the Lord? The answer to that question, that's a rhetorical question, right? Who has known mind of the Lord? The answer is nobody. He's God. Okay? Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever been, who has ever given to God? that God should repay them. For from him and through him and for him are all things. Question, is the world about us? Or put it more specifically, is the world about me? Is the world about me? Yes, of course, it's all about me. Okay, what's this say? No, no, no. The world, the universe is about God. And that's a shift in perception. So what is the chief end of people? What is the chief end of people? What is the greatest, the goal of people? The goal of people, the chief end of people, as they say in the Westminster Confession, is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's a beautiful statement, actually. To glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's the essence of what it is to be human. So from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. And he ends there. So it's a beautiful doxology. So Saul, Paul struggles with all this stuff and all these counsels of God, and he ends up then with the glory of God. He ends up in doxology. And I think that's really an important place to end up. Okay? Now, some difficulties that come up. Reading Romans, rereading Romans 9 through 11, the election, some people see this as basically the, the Israelites versus the Gentiles. And basically what it's showing in 9 to 11 is that the Israelites and the Gentiles come, are coming together in Christ. And so a lot of people, E.P. Sanders and others, I think are correctly seeing the book of Romans is not about individual salvation. We read these passages and we apply them to individuals. And what Sanders and some other people are saying is, no, these are more about corporate groups of the Jews coming together with the Gentiles. And it's, it's that that this is talking about, not individual salvation necessarily, of how can I get mine with God. And so this is uh, it's a different way of looking at it and stuff. What do you do, by the way, with the problem of evil? Okay, If God is totally sovereign over everything, what do you do with the problem, problem of evil? Okay, And so this... Um, yeah, let me get, catch up with myself here. If, if God is sovereign over everything and there's no one else, he makes all the decision, everything is determined and stuff, then what do you do about the evil? If God is over everything, then what do you do with evil? Did God make evil? If God is over everything and everything is working in counsel, his counsels and stuff, what do you do with it? It's called the problem of evil. It's called theodicy, God and righteousness. How can God, who's a righteous, holy God, how can there be evil in the world? How can God make a world that has so much pain and suffering? Just had a student in my office. We were just talking about this. How can God make a world that's full of pain and suffering? What about God himself? Does God himself suffer? He makes a world of suffering. Does God himself suffer? Remember those passages in the Old Testament where it said that God it grieved him that he had made humankind on the earth, that it grieved him. Jesus did what? Jesus wept. Can you tell me the verse where it says Jesus laughed? Where's the verses with Jesus laughed? The verse that I remember says Jesus wept. Okay? And so what I'm suggesting to you is that God enters into our pain. And what I, what I try to suggest to people is called the pathos of God, that God is the most suffering being in the universe. God is the one who designed this good and gave us free choice and things and made us the choice. And what people, rather than choosing God, they did what? 
They say, we want anything but God. We don't like you, God. We're out of here, God. How do you think that feels as far as rejection? You ever been rejected by someone you love? Does that hurt? Does that hurt to the core of your being? I know a young man who told a woman who he was married to, and he said she was wanting a divorce. And he said, I love you. I'll go to counseling. I'll do whatever it takes. Just tell me what I need to do. I'll do it. I love you. And she turned to him and said, we've been married six years. She said, I don't know whether I ever loved you. What did that do to that kid? Ripped his gut out. Ripped his gut out. And so what I'm saying is, have you ever felt rejection of love like that? It hurts big time. And what I'm suggesting is that God, as his love is huge, humongous, bigger than our love for us, God has felt that rejection for millennium. And so and there was the, the love of God. Is, is there anything better than the love of God? You know what I'm saying? It's like the best. And then we're commanded to do what? Did Jesus love us? How do you know Jesus loved us? Jesus loved us because he sacrificed. How can you tell whether somebody loves you or not? How can you tell whether somebody... You can tell by how much they're willing to sacrifice on your behalf. Okay? Do some of you know that your parents love you because your parents have sacrificed and you've seen their sacrifice on your behalf? You know that they love you. Okay? When you have somebody that just wants to use you, they want to use you for themselves... Is that love or lust? That's lust, okay? That's, that's consumptive and stuff. Love has to do with self-sacrifice, and we, they say Jesus is a... So this problem of evil. How can God be a good God and yet be a world that's created with evil and stuff? The problem of prayer. The problem of prayer. If God's going to do what God's going to do and everything's predestined, if everything's predestined, then why should you pray? Why should you pray? Some people say you pray because you're commanded to pray. God commanded you to pray, so you say, okay, we will pray now because I'm commanded to pray. Really, when you see people in Scripture, are they, are they praying because they were commanded to pray, or do they pray because they're wanting to wrestle with God? And, God, please help me. And so the problem of prayer, does prayer really change things? Does prayer change things? And actually, do you remember in the Old Testament, I showed you place after place where Moses prayed, and God changed the situation. And so what I say is prayer changes things. Prayer is powerful. Prayer is powerful where we address the God of the universe. And it's not, it's not all fixed. It's not all fixed and determined. We can interact with God and God listens. God listens, which is incredible, to our prayers. Okay? So the problem of prayer, if everything is fixed, you've got a problem with prayer. Uh, you've got a problem with God changing his mind. We showed you places, Numbers 13 and 14, uh, Exodus 32, where God comes down and is going to destroy Aaron and all the people because they were worshiping idols, and then God changes his mind. Um, God says, I-, I regret that I have made humankind on the earth in Genesis chapter 6. So can God change his mind? And the answer is, what I tried to show you is a, a really dynamic God, that God is dynamic and he's, he's, he can change. He can do all sorts of things. Stories of choice, you got Moses making choices, you got David making choices, and we went through a ton of those kind of stories of choice kinds of things. Uh, the if passages we mentioned with Saul, and um, you know I don't want to go over those again, but those are in 1 Samuel 13 and those types of things. The stories of choice would also include Adam and Eve, by the way. Um, the invitations... There are so many passages in the scripture that says, whosoever will may come, kind of thing. Whosoever will may come. Okay? Um, for God so loved the world, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so the call of God seems to go out broadly, and whosoever believes in the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. Whoever believes in the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. So, got to be careful about systems. you got to be careful about these theological systems and whether you're you know, in a reform camp, you're in an Arminian camp, you're in an openness camp, you're in whatever camp you're in and things. And what I suggest is that you learn to have grace to people and that you allow for a person that sees things from a reform perspective and they're from that tradition, you allow, you, you allow them to do that. And when, if you're from a more Wesleyan position you, and you're a Presbyterian, you don't go up to the Wesleyan and say, well, when you understand Scripture a little more deeply, you'll become Reformed like I am because we understand it much more deeply. That's a really arrogant position to be in. And so what I'm suggesting is then that, that you work more on what do we really know about God? 
what we know about God is in the scriptures. What we know about God is in the scriptures. And what I would suggest is that mystery and wonder, that we wonder. Have you ever looked at something that's really, really beautiful? Have you ever seen a person like a, a hummingbird go into a, a hummingbird go into a, a, they have these flowers, you know, hosta and stuff. The hummingbird will come up and go in the flower. And you just sit there and say, wow, that is thinking so cool. I wish I could get that on a video camera or something. Or I wish I could understand what's going on there. And so you're left with mystery and wonder that this, it's fascinating. What I'm saying is, do we get fascinated about God? And what I'm saying is, rather than trying to prescribe him theologically, he's like this, and this is the way God is, that we look at him with mystery and wonder, and that that mystery and wonder attracts us, and it gets our focus. It gets our focus because we're so enthralled with that. Transcendence and imminence. Now, these are just two theological concepts. Transcendence means that God is totally other, that God is is different than we are. And so there's a sense in which God is disconnected from the world. He's bigger than the universe. I mean, he created the universe. And so he's, he's, makes, he's, he's different than anything we've ever known. He's different than anything. So that's called the God's transcendence, that he transcends the whole universe and our brains as well. Imminent. Imminence means that God is, is so close. He's as close as our breath. That God is so close to us that he is... Does God... How should I say, do some of you walk around this campus experiencing the presence of God? Yes, God is close to us. And so you get the sense that God is transcendent. He's as, as grand and as, as the ocean and bigger mountains and stuff like that. But yet God is so close to us, he's still what? A still small voice. So these kind of concepts, holy other, but yet he's relational. He's, he's different than we are, but yet he, he's chosen to love us. And the love of God the love of God is just the richest thing in the world, okay? Um, I ask, you know, my kids are growing up and things like that. Do my kids love me? Um, <laughs> do, you, do you remember saying some things to your parents um, that you can't? Actually, my, my, one of my children, and it's no big deal. You'll never meet them and stuff like that. My daughter has told me to go to hell more than any other individual in the world has ever told me where to go, okay? And she just, when she was young, that was her, I mean... How should I say? She would just blow up. She knew no limits. I mean, just when she was, it just didn't blow up and, you know, go to, you know, boom and stuff. And I didn't, you know, how should I say? I tried to, I tried to understand her, never did, but I tried to understand her and work with it. And we tried to, you know, and, and that was a really rough time in our, our existence, okay? Um, that was really a rough time. I'll never forget it. And yet, and yet what now? She's, now she's an old lady. She's in her 30s. <laughs> And, and what? Do I love my daughter? Does my daughter? I hope she loves me and stuff. But she, uh, and we've had, you know, we've come back and stuff like that. And we have a relationship. And so what I'm saying is God is relational. And there may be times where a person comes through and has some really bad times. I had a friend who taught philosophy. I used to teach at a really, really conservative school. And this guy taught philosophy there. And he was a, a Gusal believer, went through, you know, a theological training, seminary training kind of thing to study philosophy and stuff. And I remember he went through a divorce. And in the divorce, his wife got the child. He loved this daughter. He loved his daughter. I can't, there was just, he loved his daughter. And when the wife got the daughter and he got nothing, he just, he just blew up at God. He was so angry at God. And it was like he said, F God, F God. I don't know how many times. We talked for 30 minutes. I swear he said F God 30 times in 30 minutes. Now, by the way, did that mean he was throwing God away? And at that point in his life, it was, yeah, I don't want to see God. God screwed my whole life up. Look at what happened. I lost the child. The only thing I loved in this stinking world was that child. And now my wife's got the child and she won't let me see her except I'm very... Anyways, and so he was just totally angry at God. Now, by the way, you could give somebody a lecture like that. You shouldn't talk like that, <laughs> okay? But is it possible that he was expressing his rage, his rage... And is it possible 10 years later that, you know what I'm saying, he comes back to the Lord and stuff like that? You don't know. You don't know. And so what I'm saying is that we as Christians, it seems to me we, we need to listen. We need to listen to people. When people are throwing rage and stuff like that, allow them. Love does what? Jesus says what? What do you do with those that weep? You weep with those that weep, and you rejoice with those that rejoice. Is that right? I thought it's you you rejoice and a hundred people rejoice with you. You weep and no one's there. Isn't that the way it goes? 
You weep and there's no one there. You rejoice and you have all sorts of friends. Been there. Anyways. So, okay. So God is relational. And what he's suggesting that is we as Christians, if we're going to love other people, we need to be relational like God is. God listens to us. God listens to us in the highs. God listens to us in the lows. Some of you may be depressed right now. <laughs> You're coming up to final exams. That'll do it. Uh, and you, you may get depressed and stuff down. And you may, you know, be really down. And what I'm saying is, how should I say, the Christian life is alive. I think that's, what, you know, Christian life isn't meant to be steady state. The Christian life is alive. Sometimes there'll be like a million bucks. Other times you'll be really down. And what I'm saying is Christian life goes like that. Christianity is alive, okay? And your relationship with God is alive. Your relationship with other people is alive. Sometimes other people will hurt you really badly. Sometimes you'll be, feel betrayed even by God. Sometimes you'll be feel betrayed even by God. What I'm saying is, you know, it's part of loving somebody else, okay? On breaking boxes, and be careful about heretic hunting. Some people, that their theology is so tight, their theology is so tight that they think that they're the only ones that write and they go after other people. And what I'm suggesting is be careful about the heretic hunting stuff. Learn to love. Learn to love. By the way, love doesn't mean, you know, my daughter goes off on me like that. Does that mean she got disciplined? And the answer is yes, she got disciplined. Part of that was for her own good. Part of that was for her own good. Okay, so what I'm saying is be careful about heretic hunting, though. Learn to love. Learning to love doesn't mean you accept, you know, the things that they're saying is wrong, but, but you, you, do, you can do it in a, in a basically working away from arrogance, this position that I know, I know you don't know, and working from a position of arrogance to a position of humility. And that's a, I think that's a really important thing, that you come to another person and you try to listen to them and understand them and basically and love them in Christ, and love them in Christ. And so, um, okay, so all these things in Romans have raised really questions and stuff like that. The importance of the sovereignty of God. You know, it's one of the great things in the world. Who wins in the end? Now, some people you know, get upset when you say this, but who wins in the end? Oh, oh, that's right. We're in America. We don't talk about winning anymore. Anyways, okay, but uh, I'm sorry. Uh, but, okay, who wins in the end? Is the Bible tell us that God wins in the end? That evil, evil does not triumph? That suffering and pain, what happens to it? It says what? In the end, in the book of Revelation, it says he wipes away all tears. By the way, when he's in the book of Revelation, at the end of all time, and he says he wipes away all tears, does that mean that there are tears in heaven to be wiped away? Yes. Okay, so actually, Eric Clapton was right. There are tears in heaven. No, seriously, there are tears in heaven. And Christ says that someday they'll be wiped away. And that brings us what? That brings us hope. And so these things in the book of Romans then bring us hope and choice and this kind of thing. Now, Christian living, um, let's just hit these things quickly here. Self-sacrifice, Romans 12, beautiful passage. Uh, This is one, I don't know whether I got you guys memorizing this, but it's one worthy of memorization. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. So it talks about the transforming of the mind. Hopefully that's what happens at Gordon College. This Romans 12, 9 is another one I like. It says, love must be sincere. And I'm going to flip it. It says, cling to what is good. Cling to what is good. In our society sometimes, do we like to put evil things in front of people all the time and get them to wrestle with evil and stuff like that? It says, cling to what is good. And it says, hate what is what is evil. It seems to me, if I were to critique our own community here, that we're good at clinging to what is good, but, but, but the hatred of evil, I don't see that too much, okay? The hatred is just to hate what is evil. And I think that's a really important thing there, the hating of evil. Um, I think Christians can get, in some sense, too nice, overcoming evil with good. Um, how do you respond to evil? How do you respond to evil? It says, do not be overcome by evil. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I think that's a beautiful thing. How do you fight evil? You fight evil by doing good. And so that's one of the things actually that really motivates me. I get up and I think, how do, how do I do the most good that I can do in a single day as an individual? You know, what can I do? Um, 
evil? Do I go out and fight evil or do I go out and try to do good and let the good overcome the evil and things? So those are important things. Now, Romans 13, important passage on government. And this is uh, significant. I want to read this passage uh, here on government and governmental choices and things. Um, Yeah. On government. It says this one. Everyone must submit himself to governing authorities, for there is no authority except that God has established. The authorities exist, have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For the rulers hold no terror to those who do right, but those who do wrong. So it's basically saying we need to submit to government authorities. Um, do we like government authorities? Uh, it says here, rulers hold no terror to those who do right. Any of you get followed by a police car and you get the terror feeling? Okay. I've been there. Then you say, are the policemen really there to protect me to do what's right or they're there to, because they think I'm a college student running down Grapevine Road, they're going to give me a ticket. Okay. And so, but, but notice the Bible has a real high view that the governing authorities have been placed by God. And uh, so, therefore, there's a submission to government that happens. Uh, very interesting concept. By the way, did the early church submit to the government? Did the government persecute the early church? Many of the early Christians were killed. The 12 apostles, all 12 of them, except Judas hanged himself, but the apostles were killed by the you know, various things. So, submit to government. Chapter 14 has this thing about judging brothers or brothers and sisters in Christ. One person's faith allows him to eat everything. This is talking about being a vegan. Yeah, okay, thank Josh for the smile. I just I get worried people are taking me serious. Uh, one man's faith allows him to eat everything. Another person's, another, uh, but another person whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. A person who eats everything must not look down on him who does not. And a person who does not eat everything must not condemn the person who does. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. And he's saying, basically, you've got to be careful about this weaker brother. And therefore, if what I do causes my brother to, or sister to sin, then I'm going to stop doing what I do. Even though I have the right to eat meat, and I know it's not going to offer it up to idols, I, I don't eat that because I know it's offensive to my brother or sister. And so this is talking about the weaker brother or sister, and it's saying basically that, that yes, you have freedom to do all sorts of things, but you, you curtail that freedom because you're concerned about another person. You don't want to lead them astray. And so this is called the Christian liberty passage and the weaker brother. And therefore, do you guys celebrate the Sabbath? Do some of you really strict on how you celebrate the Sabbath? I know there are faculty members who are very Sabbatarian here. And other people, um, like m- myself, and actually my wife ended up, uh, she's a CPA, she ended up working last Sunday, she ended up working the whole crazy day. Now, do we like that? We don't like that, but that's just the way her business is. My daughter's a nurse practitioner, okay? Does a nurse practitioner have to work in the hospital on a Sunday? No, no, she tells all the people, don't get sick on Sunday, you know? I mean, if you're a nurse, you're going to have to work on Sunday because people get sick on Sunday and things. So... Um, it just it depends, and so therefore, don't be judgmental to other people on some of these things that don't matter, and that type of thing. So, that's the book of Romans. Um, you guys will be working on Corinthians this week, and when we get back, we'll start on the book of First Corinthians. Okay, thanks. This is Dr. Ted Hildebrandt in his teaching on New Testament. This is session number 24, Romans, part 2.